4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Receiving a mandate in 2011 to form a majority government Stephen Harper's first address to the Canadian people included a promise. Stephen Harper declared, his job was to bring the Canadian people together, maintain a fiscally responsible open government and work on non-partisan legislation with opposition members. In less than 100 days into their mandate the Conservative government led by Stephen Harper, kicked those pledges to the curb and introduced the first omnibus bill, the Safe Streets and Communities Act. Bill C-10, a 300-page crime bill that combines nine other bills that did not pass in previous parliaments. The 300-page crime bill is stuffed full of some very controversial amendments, such as the dismantling of the gun registry and minimum mandatory sentence regardless of circumstances. The Parliamentary Budget Officer, Kevin Page, has estimated that the average cost per offender will rise from approximately $2,600 to $41,000 as a consequence of the elimination of conditional sentences. Over the last four years, a number of amendments credited to Bill C-10 have been struck down by the Supreme Court as being unconstitutional, including a more recent minimum mandatory sentencing for simple gun-related offences. The Court of Appeal's conclusion was written by McLaughlin for the majority. There exists a cavernous disconnect between the severity of the licensing type offense and the mandatory minimum three-year term of imprisonment. A pattern has emerged as amendment after amendment is challenged and deemed by the Supreme Court to be infringing on the Canadian Charter of Rights. The Omnibus Bill's controversial amendments touched on a wide range of areas of public policy and had been scrutinized by the established critical players and found to not meet constitutional muster. The minimum sentencing law is the same failed policy that filled the United States prison system with hundreds of thousands of nonviolent offenders and swelled the prison population to over two million. The prison system costs billions to support and created a private for-profit prison industry. The Correctional Service of Canada's federal budget in 2013 increased by 40% to $2.6 billion in the previous five years, most of it being spent on building 2,700 new prison cells. Overall spending in the Canadian justice system rose 23% between 2003 and 2013. In that same period, Canada's crime rate fell by 23%. Stephen Harper's plan to create employment is to lock up more Canadians, a plan complements of the think tank Profits and the American Republican Party. It will soon become apparent to Canadians that Stephen Harper will engage in a form of enforced tunnel vision. Opinions within the government that are in conflict with the principles of the Conservative Party will be sanctioned into silence. To even consider anything outside the scope of the overall vision of the party by members will become a form of blasphemy. Stephen Harper sees only one solution for Canada, neoliberal austerity measures proclaimed by the think tanks as the only path to more profits for the top 10%. Dismantling Canada's social safety net and the rights of Canadians to object is the final push to mould Canada into a confused mix of greedy libertarians who use social conservative religious values to justify nationalistic beliefs of chauvinistic superiority and want a government no longer concerned with the welfare of the poor, only the rich. Exactly what the conservative movement in the United States has degraded to. For the next four years Stephen Harper and the Conservative Party will conduct an all-out assault on the principles of democracy and cause major disruptions to the social and political landscape of Canada.
1994 young Stephen Harper stood in the Canadian House of Commons and made an excellent case for the reasons omnibus bills are anti-democratic and should not be allowed. Stephen Harper was in opposition to Bill C-17 tabled by the Liberals, a 21-page omnibus bill with five specific subjects related to the budget. Stephen Harper began his address to the Speaker of the House with the declaration. The particular bill before us, Bill C-17, is of an omnibus nature. I put it to you Mr. Speaker, that you should rule it out of order and it should not be considered by the House in the form in which it has been presented. First, there is a lack of relevancy of these issues. The omnibus bills we have before us attempted to amend several different existing laws. Second, in the interest of democracy I ask, how can members represent their constituents on these various areas when they are forced to vote in a block on such legislation and on such concerns? Dividing the bill into several components would allow members to represent views of their constituents on each of the different components in the bill. Asking members to provide simple answers to such complex questions is in contradiction to the conventions and practices of the House. As well this will cause fairly serious difficulties in committee. This bill will ultimately go to only one committee of the House, a committee that will inevitably lack the breadth of expertise required for consideration of a bill of this scope. Furthermore, the workload of that committee will be onerous and it will be very difficult to give due consideration to all relevant opinion. I put it once again that this bill touches on a wide range of areas of public policy, what would normally fall in the purview of several House committees to look at. Most Canadians and indeed all those who agreed with Stephen Harper's statement that it is the Parliament that's supposed to run the country, not just the largest party and the single leader, would express disapproval with the practice of using omnibus bills in the legislating process. It becomes an assault on democracy and is seen as a considerable abuse of power when it becomes the only method used by the government to legislate. The Conservative government's second omnibus bill arrived in April of 2012. Bill C-38, the Jobs, Growth and Long-Term Prosperity Act. A 425-page budget bill that affected 74 regulations or Acts of Parliament. Amendments to a number of Acts have been labelled by experts and watchdogs from the public and private sector, as highly partisan and far-reaching outside the scope of a budget bill. In an overview of Bill C-38, by the Environmental Law Centre. It substantively changes federal environmental law in Canada. Over 10 pieces of federal environmental legislation are amended or repealed by Bill C-38. As well, Bill C-38 amends the charity provisions of the Income Tax Act which may have profound implications for many of Canada's environmental organizations. Again the members of parliament were forced to vote one time, in a block, in line with the party on all of the legislation included in the omnibus bill. Canadians have every right to be suspect of omnibus legislation and a government that uses them, especially when the scope is wide-ranging. A hydra with many heads, it's not easy to determine their motives and long-term ramifications. The Harper government's unrelenting assault on Canada's democracy continued when they introduced a third omnibus bill in December 2012. Bill C-45, the Jobs and Growth Act. Bill C-45 was widely condemned right off the start. A 400-page omnibus bill that changed the legislation contained in 64 acts. Critics charged the Conservatives had failed to adequately consult with experts or Indigenous peoples when crafting the amendments to the Indian Act, the Navigable Waters Act, and the Environmental Assessment Act. Bill C-45's language raised a number of concerns with the Aboriginal people of Canada, giving birth to the Idle No More movement. One alarming provision allows the Aboriginal Affairs Minister to call a meeting to consider surrendering banned territory. An informal but binding vote can be conducted at these meetings regardless of how many people show up. The minister can choose to ignore a resolution from the band council that's in opposition to a decision at the meeting. Previously, approval required the support of a majority of eligible voters. 
the recklessness of the Harper government's legislating process has ignited activist movements across the country. Bill C-60, Economic Action Plan 2013, Act 1. At only a 128 pages, but still of an omnibus nature, Bill C-60 was branded as an attack on the CBC, Canadian culture and press freedom. Since the rebirth of the Conservative Party of Canada in 2003, CBC has been a target. Stephen Harper has made repeated attempts to convince Canadians the natural ruling party of Canada is the Conservative Party. The CBC is superb at representing the Canadian culture, and as we have seen from the election results, a greater number of Canadians vote left of the Conservative Party. The cultural dominance will inescapably be evident in CBC's programming. The CBC is after all a crown corporation, and expected to generate revenue. That business model requires a loyal base of Canadians to utilize the services. It would only stand to reason, that to the extent the Conservative Party has demonized the CBC, Conservative supporters, would not be interested in utilizing the CBC's news and entertainment services. By slashing the budget the Harper government is in fact forcing the CBC to narrow the user demographic. Harper's attack on the public broadcaster has not gone unnoticed by the loyal viewers and supporters. Canadians have always counted on the CBC to be a reliable news source, independent of the corporate influence of the monopolized media conglomerates, and the ruling government. A letter to Stephen Harper in May of 2013, signed by 16 eminent Canadians from the worlds of journalism and academia expresses deep concern with Bill C-60. Bill C-60 proposes to amend the Financial Administration Act to permit the government to set the mandate for and audit CBC's collective bargaining, as well as give the government a veto over CBC's collective agreements. This means that the government would become the effective employer of CBC's personnel, including its journalists, producers and story editors. Such powers would intrude into the CBC's independence, well beyond its employees' compensation. Conditions of work are an integral part of CBC's collective agreements with its various employee groups. Such conditions currently provide assurance of the integrity of CBC as an independent national public broadcaster, as required under the Broadcasting Act. We can see the last vanguards of the CBC, its unions and workers being used as scapegoats. Stephen Harper has a plan for the dismantling and privatization of the CBC. Nine of the twelve current board members are appointed by Stephen Harper and loyal party supporters and donors to the Conservative Party. The Conservative mandate has made it quite clear, the Harper appointees are there for no other reason than to help facilitate the demolition of the public broadcaster. An argument has been presented that the unions also make political contributions. But that would be what is considered a straw man argument, considering the unions have no control over the future of the CBC, unlike CBC's board of directors. The CBC has stopped making documentaries, and almost all of their production work is now outsourced. Valuable resources that help Canadian filmmakers produce Canadian cultural content are no longer available. If the Conservative Party remains in power it's only a matter of time before the Broadcast Act is stripped down by an omnibus bill. Then brought forth, in June 2013, Omnibus Bill No. 5, Bill C-48, an unprecedented 1,000-page technical bill. Normally, a yearly tax utility bill is tabled to solve small issues in the tax code. But the government under Stephen Harper's leadership, had neglected to present technical bills for the last seven years. Bill C-48 made huge changes to the Income Tax Act, some amendments retroactive to 2007. In November 2013, Bill C-4, Economic Action Plan 2013 Act 2, a 321-page omnibus bill, that slapped Labour in the face. The Public Service Alliance of Canada reported. Bill C-4 takes away the democratic rights of federal public sector employees, and seriously undermines the health and safety protections, 
in the Canada Labour Code covering workers under federal jurisdiction. Canadian Civil Liberties Association made an even more formidable statement. C-10 is a violation of nine of the most fundamental civil rights conventions in international law, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Stephen Harper's neoliberal fiscal tunnel vision and ideology demands he attack public service employees and organized labor at every opportunity. Organized labor could be described as the arch enemy of neoliberal fiscal policies. Unions crushed predatory capitalism after the Second World War. Stephen Harper, a graduate of the Calgary School of Economics and a missionary for Milton Friedman's free market economic prophecies knows that fact. The scheme to continue to funnel money to the top can only be maintained if the cost of labor drops and workers are kept in economic terror. Then Omnibus Bill No. 7. Stuffed down the throat of democracy in March 2014, Bill C-31, Economic Action Plan 2014 Act, 1. The 375-page Omnibus Bill, showed Canadian Stephen Harper and the Conservative caucus had abandoned Parliament, and were exclusively ruling by decree. Elections Canada was reduced to a small child told to go sit in the corner, face the wall and read the new rules written in crayon. Number 18 December 2014, Bill C-43 Economic Action Plan 2014 Act, Number 2. Another 425-page omnibus bill made it quite clear Stephen Harper and the Conservative Party of Canada have simply gone mad and abandoned the principles of democracy. At this point the substance of these mammoth omnibus bills is irrelevant. The obvious abuse of authority is now the only factor. Then in 2015, just days after the attack on the Canadian Parliament by a lone Islamic extremist, omnibus bill C-51 was tabled. The bill opens the door for massive surveillance operations by government security agencies and private contractors, targeting more than just the Islamic extremist, but Canadians who protest government policies. Stephen Harper's Conservative government's use of omnibus legislation is unprecedented in Canadian history. Lawrence Martin in an article in The Globe and Mail published Monday, April 6, 2015, titled It's Not Just Duffy. The Harper era is on trial. Martin referred to omnibus bills as democracy shredding when describing the Harper government's serial breaches of the public trust. More serious for Conservatives is that the Senate scandal might reopen the vault on the larger abuse of power narrative that has dogged the Harper government. It may be seen as a microcosm of the serial breaches of the public trust, the undercover dirty tricks, the smear campaigns against opponents the altering of official documents, the democracy shredding omnibus bills. Over the past four years Canadians have indeed been witness to a serial assault on the country's legal and economic framework, cultural values, the working class's social safety net, organized labor, and what was left of the Keynesian era market protections. Stephen Harper's conviction to the free market's laissez-faire capitalist structure, his libertarian fiscal austerity ideology, and his social conservative values has been well known for years, a look at his past revealed that fact. But now it has become quite clear, Stephen Harper's well-publicized statements championing his democratic values were nothing more than a facade. The principles of good governance and democratic freedoms are in the way of what many conservative Canadians thought to be, the great virtuoso of democracy, who has now been revealed to be the Mad King who rules from the Iron Throne, using omnibus decrees, 